Aya, Japan Bar River Cruise is made possible thanks to those who donate to the show at japanbarrivercruise.com and due to the generosity of our corporate sponsors. This week's show is sponsored by the Kozlo offices of Chosakutsuke, Mimpo-chan and Mech. Are you concerned about your rights as a cosplayer? Scared to be seen in your spidey suit for fear of a spidey lawsuit? Then you need the services of Chosakutsuke, Mimpo-chan and Mech, costernies at law. With the combined experience of Chosakusuke, the mind and soul of an ex-Supreme Court justice in the body of an elementary schooler. Mimpo-chan, a go-getting legal whiz with an F-cup chest and an 18-inch waist, which means legal opinions are literally the only thing she can balance. And mech, a mech. Our costernies can help you with any of your cosplay legal needs, by which we mean make-believe legal needs, because all of our attorneys are just pretending to be lawyers. So get in touch today, especially if you're a lawyer, because apparently running this advertisement is a crime. Hello, Brian, and welcome back to Japan by River Cruise. I'm Bobby Judo. Hello, I'm Molly Horn. And joining us this week is Kat Gunn, professional gamer, pro cosplayer, and the only person to ever win both the All Japan Dead or Alive 4 Riverboat Open and costume contest in the same year. Kat, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. On this week's show, the Japanese government takes a look at revising the laws around cosplaying copyrighted characters. But don't worry, it's not about destroying the cosplay community's creativity. It's about profiting off of it. Plus, Ali's got your weekly River Cruise recommendation. Ali? Yes, Bobby. Have you ever wondered what happened to all of the tapioca pearls after Japan's bubble tea bubble burst? Well, one sprightly young engineering team in Kobe has made Japan's first River Cruise boat made entirely out of recycled tapioca. The good news? The jumbo straws, too, have been repurposed into tunnels that you get stuck in on the way. And a new River Cruise-based fitness plan. The Namidegawa River Cruise Company has figured out a way to avoid overcrowding their boats, bolster their business, and provide a valuable customer service. For just twice the price of a regular ticket, they'll let you swim after the boat for a brisk 90-minute workout. Plus, Brian is here. Yep. More on that later, but first, Soap Talk. Kat, I may be wrong, but you might be our first ever guest who has not been to Japan. This is quite this is quite the honor. I regret being that person because uh, Japan to me is one of my go-to destinations, especially for how much of a weeb I am. I, I totally expected that to end badly. I thought you were going to regret being on the show. No, 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 not yet, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I regret. This has been a terrible misunderstanding. There's, there's still time for uh, that. <laughs> for listeners that aren't aware, you're... Uh, a, a, a big cosplayer, let me put it this way. Is Japan the, the number one source for the kind of creations which inspire you? Absolutely. I mean, when it comes to anime and just the creativity that comes out of Japan and pretty much most of my off time is spent consuming mainly that. I mean, right now it's all Jujutsu Kaisen. Uh, that's the next big thing. So even looking at cosplay from that uh, show itself but yeah J- japan i mean studio ghibli and all the stuff that's out there uh mm. and even just the food i mean everything about it i'm i'm pretty jealous actually well if you if they ever let tourists back in you should definitely come visit i will um if i'm not mistaken i think most of your income comes from gaming these days as a pro gamer is that correct yeah it's between shoutcasting uh broadcasting on twitch and facebook for gaming as well as basically making appearances or you know like going to booths and doing 1v1 type of situations. So as somebody whose main source of income was already online, how has the pandemic affected your work? It has actually made it more relevant because now everybody needs to be entertained at home and doesn't spend a lot of their time obviously working their nine to five. Um, Mm. So it's a little bit of half and half, like more people have actually gotten into streaming too. But at the same time, people need to be entertained while we try to get through this crap we had a bit of a joke when lots of people got into podcasting we felt very fortunate that we just started our podcast just before the pandemic is there has there been people that have started streaming since the pandemic has started and got on to become big or have the kind of established players like you still uh, still help no, uh, it absolutely has changed in terms of celebrities and uh, even the events that I'm hosting um, I spoke to Mike Tyson and people you wouldn't normally think uh, would be involved in the gaming scene so it 
Yeah, right. a lot of it is starting to mesh worlds where people you didn't even know played video games are now getting into it because they need something to do. And this is the best thing pretty much to do at this current state. And does that mean more money in the industry or... <laughs> Uh, more money in the industry but less going to the to the people that were there uh, first no, i think it's i think all around it's always kind of booming i don't think gaming has ever taken a down slope in uh in terms of just how mm. it's grown from the past what about on a personal level a lot of my work before the pandemic started was all screen based uh i was spending a large portion of my day looking at a screen and now all of the other aspects that i was able to do away from a screen you know um have shifted to online as well. So it's like double the amount of time a day I've spent looking at a screen. And I feel like it's starting to take a little bit of a toll. I wonder uh, if somebody who already had more experience kind of being in that world, how you've experienced it. Yeah, I think it's taking a toll for almost everyone that's, uh, you know, in terms of just like mental health and trying to get back to what a lot of people like doing, just activity based. Like I even miss the gym. I actually have a decent amount of COVID weight that I am putting on because I didn't realize that like being at the gym was something that worked out for me. I actually watched anime while I would like do cardio and stuff because it was just make the time fly by. So um, I don't know if that was specific to your question there, but yeah, I think I think I think we're all consuming a lot more online, and I do think that there's no, but but it does it does lead us on to my uh, questions, which as as regular listeners of the show know, I always ask guests about their Ooh. gym routine. So uh, <laughs> I, I guess I, I guess yes, you're an avid gym goer, right? Uh, well, look, we, we are going <laughs> correct. We are going to be talking uh, about. Uh, one aspect of monetization of your work, which is cosplaying and how the rules in Japan uh, might be changing uh, as regards copyright. Ding, ding. Oh, oh dear. I can hear a jingle coming on. Uh, Bobby, let's dive into the news. Bobby Judah, what's in the news this week? Well, Japan is taking another look at revising the rules around professional cosplay. Uh, around people who make money by cosplaying copyrighted characters. Kat, as, believe it or not, the only one of us here with professional cosplay experience, can you give us a general overview of the different kinds of ways in which people earn money cosplaying? There are quite a few ways, actually, that people have earned money via cosplaying, whether it's an appearance at an event, representing characters and bringing attention to booths, whether you do maybe an OnlyFans or a Patreon, which gets paid for via your images and photography mm. um, or lack of clothing, but still cosplaying. Cosplaying, but not a lot of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> still still looks great. Um, so appearances, um, oh, and then hired by companies. You can actually be hired directly by a company to um, be a character, like represent their character specifically to help promote a, a new release or whatever mm. they're trying to be more involved with. Um, and you can also sell your own cosplay uh what would you call it? What is it called? Like material? No. What would you call it? Commissions? Oh, yeah. You, could even, you can even sell your own cosplay commissions, uh, whether you want to create stuff for other people as well. I've actually purchased like corsets and things that I'm not very well at crafting myself. So uh, Okay. Like costumes and props and things like yeah, that. Yeah. You can make props. You can make outfits. Um, even if a company wants to hire you and you can't create it yourself, you can hire mm -hmm. somebody else to create it for you. And when you talk about a company wanting to hire you, Specifically, you're talking about the rights holder of that character hiring you to play that character. Sometimes. Ooh. So if you're working a booth, remember like booth babes being a thing, right? Yeah. And that's kind of chilled out. Now, I think booth babes are more geared towards actual um, relevant, you know, like instead of just booty shorts, now they wear like armored booty shorts, which is a character. So uh, <laughs> right. yeah, you can be hired by the specific company. You definitely can. Where it's, uh, I was actually hired uh, one of the Microsoft games called Re Recore, where they wanted to hire me to be the main character. And um, there's many, you can either do it for a side company and just be a character, or you can do it directly with the company itself, which obviously would help go around the copyright issue. Mm. Yeah, it sounds like most of your paid cosplay appearances were for the company that held the intellectual property rights for the so, most part i actually worked yeah. for gigabyte and that was at a blizzcon and i was just a blizzard character uh for gigabyte at their booth so to talk a little bit more about how exactly these uh rules around copyrights might change in japan and how that might affect the cosplaying industry here we'd like to bring on our jbrc official intellectual property law specialist Holly, it's your time to shine japan's best to send the news align we need a legal 
online and you're the man for it. No need for a judge and no need for a jury. Mr. Horn has credentials to cover a Japanese intellectual property law story. Welcome to your real house. Thank you. Right, so the basics are... It's fine to cosplay if you're not making money from it. Because intellectual property law basically says, in general, you only have a claim against someone for infringing your rights if they've taken money out of your pocket. And so copyright law is basically all about who gets to monetize stuff that's been made. So if you're not doing something that typically makes money, generally, and of course there are some exceptions, but generally you're fine. Uh, But what's interesting is it's the successful big cosplayers in Japan that seem to be the biggest advocates to make sure that this kind of key tenet of copyright law doesn't change. And Bobby and I interviewed Japanese cosplayer star Reika, who, by the way, if you don't know her, go check out her Instagram. Uh, She's insanely good. Uh, About how the professional community has reacted to this news. Reika-san, thank you very much for taking the time. We've read that some people think that if these rules are implemented badly, it could potentially destroy cosplay culture. Do you think that's likely? I think that in creating these rules, they'll be listening to people who are involved with the industry. So I don't think we'll end up with laws that we look at and go, oh no, how did this happen? I think the result will be something well-balanced. And so in terms of what these new rules might do to restrict what cosplayers are allowed to do, is there anything that concerns you specifically? Well, for example, we upload our cosplay photos to the internet, right? And we might use those, for example, in an advertising campaign we buy to promote our own Facebook posts or our own Instagram posts, using our own money. And if doing that is going to be something that gets restricted because of new copyright rules, then... Well, really, that uploader isn't earning anything. They're doing it as a hobby. But if lots of people are now going to look at it and go, you can't do that, this is bad, that could become a problem. The danger of having unrelated people who don't know how this works starting to chime in is a danger that I'm very concerned about. Do you think these rules will make it easier or potentially harder for future generations to get into cosplay? Hmm. Right now, there are tons of younger people who want to be or look up to pro cosplayers and have taken up cosplay as a hobby. And of course, these kids don't have a lot of money. So, for example, if the quality of their cosplay is deemed not good enough to get permission, if we somehow end up in a situation where if you can't cosplay that character without permission, I think it will negatively impact the feeling behind cosplay. If the feeling of affinity for a character or a work is upset by that, that would be a shame. And if you can't get permission to cosplay certain characters, how does that affect your ability to make it into the world of professional cosplay in the first place? When we were coming up, because we would cosplay popular characters that we loved, we ended up being seen by lots of people and appreciated by lots of people and gaining a fan base. And I really worry that we might be headed into an era where the public doesn't recognize the feeling that goes into it and just says, you greedy cosplayers are out to make money. You have to get permission. So Reika talked a little bit about the difference between amateur and professional cosplayers. Uh, It did seem like a lot of amateur cosplayers here were worried about this. Ali, would these rules actually affect whether or not people can dress up like their favorite characters? Well, we we don't know what the actual rules are going to be, but the general principle of copyright law is that you're only really uh, prevented from using someone's design uh, if you're causing some kind of financial harm to that person. If the activity which you're doing, they should be monetizing themselves. So if what you're doing is non-commercial or falls into one of the other exceptions, right? Like if you're using it to parody an original work, if you're using it for education, then I don't think copyright law will bite. I think what they're proposing is one of the proposals is actually to come up with a register of copyright holders. This is a brand new idea because normally you get copyright automatically. You don't need to actually go to a registry office if you've created a painting or if you've written a song. You just get the copyright by virtue of your original authorship. And I think what Japan is looking to do is to say, well, sometimes it's very difficult for cosplayers to actually get permission from the rights holders, even if that permission they might just give for free anyway. So I think what Japan is looking to do is to help build relationships between rights holders and cosplayers. So it seems that amateur cosplayers shouldn't worry. However, 
those that are making money from it probably should worry. Partly because right now the reason why there's a bit of a lacuna in the law is that generally clothing doesn't fall under copyright. I mean, you can copyright the design of a costume and derivative designs, but you can't actually copyright a physical costume. And then there's all sorts of weird technicalities about how if there are certain aspects of a clothing that are inseparable from the actual functionality of it, then you can't copyright that either. And so I think what Japan's trying to do is just kind of tighten up uh, a couple of these uh, use cases, like Kat mentioned, of if you're licensing the design mm. of a costume uh, or if you're performing as a particular character. And we should mention that the main reason that Japan cares about this now is because there was a cosplayer named Enako who went on some social media and bragged about earning like 50 million yen for her agency doing cosplay. And it attracted the attention of the copyright holders. It was, it basically boils down to someone going, look at all the money I'm making off of this. And the copyright holders going, wait a minute, shouldn't some of that money be ours? Baka. Yes. And that makes sense, right? And and we're happy with that. You know, like if someone were to do a cover song of a song and they're doing so at a party, no one cares. But if they're doing so on national radio, maybe the person who's written that song should get some money for it. So, so Kat, in your world, do, do you have you ever had these awkward conversations where you've had someone say, can you perform as someone for whom you don't hold the rights? And you've gone, OK, now what do I do? Yeah, ironically enough, I don't think uh, I think in America we are so like freedom. We do whatever the we want so i don't know i feel like we don't quite face those issues just yet <laughs> actually in this in the streaming world we're facing the issues of dmca with music copyrights mm. right and that's only recently sprung up yes. so i can see that starting to transform into a cosplay setting if anything it's a lot more on the caddy side of the cosplayers themselves where if you don't credit the photographer and the person who may have assisted or even if you take somebody else's concept and don't necessarily credit that's also an issue issue of itself um, and I'm sure mm. once we get more advanced into the actual companies uh, like Nintendo for instance is very very stickler even about doing their games and whatnot so yeah I can see that starting to become an issue I spoke with Matt Alt about this and he he made the same comparison I was asking about whether or not this would negatively affect like future cosplayers people who wanted to get into the industry and he said that that was like asking does the fact that a system now exists for licensing samples of music adversely affect the next generation of musicians and I think the answer is no you can sample and make mixes all you want but as soon as you turn pro you start selling that you are obligated to compensate the people whose work you are borrowing so kat you mentioned like costume design and borrowing props and things like that um or buying or making props and things like that if the design of that costume is exactly in line with the design of the character and you are then profiting by selling that in an OnlyFans or, you know, you take a picture of yourself wearing that costume and you sign it and sell it at a convention. Where do you see the rights issues coming into play there? Now, I was wondering if Ollie may have more insight to understanding transformative and how that actually starts to diminish the copyright issues that we may be facing. So if anything, I think just like Pentatonix may take a song and make it beatbox and get to take that and make profit off it, we might be seeing more of a generation of creativity where transformative allows it to be yours and no longer uh, reflecting upon the company and the image that they represent. Yes, and this is a really good point. So the difference between a transformative use and a derivative use is basically, have you been sufficiently creative yourself such that the new thing that you've created is distinguishable and different from the original work? And, you know, people use the transformative work exception for things like uh, fan fiction and, you know, like... Uh, Th those kind of uh, works which have nothing to do with the original work but they they nevertheless have the, the own intellectual uh, creation uh, and the kind of stamp of artistry uh, of of the the new author the person that's created that that new work so I, I think I think this is a really good point that whereas in the past uh, cosplayers were incentivized to look exactly like the original character now there's there's maybe going to be a movement towards being inspired by the DNA of that character and creating something so different that you're not taking the substantial part, and that's the copyright test, are you taking a substantial part, but rather creating something which is in the inspiration of. And you're right, that would fall completely outside of the current copyright laws. Kat, in the extras, you mentioned that one of your favorite examples of cosplay is uh, that guy on Instagram who does the awful, awful, low quality cosplay. 
Ollie, yes. is there an argument that being low enough quality can actually protect you in a sense? <laughs> yes, and it's funny you mentioned this because in trademark law, which of course is different to copyright law, uh, but there are some similarities between the two. Uh, there was a case about five years ago in the UK where I think it was Topshop made some t-shirts with Rihanna's picture on it. And the judge said, yeah, you should have asked Rihanna before you did this. But they did also say there are some cases where if the design you make is like so bad that the artist would never have said yes to it. Like it's obviously not done with their approval. <laughs> then on that legal technicality, you would be allowed to make it because, you know, many countries don't have image rights uh, in like celebrity faces. And if it's obvious to the consumer that, there's no way they said yes to this, then you can sell it. <laughs> so maybe there is some kind of loophole in cosplay that if you just do a really bad job, you're just really, really crap at it, th there's an argument to say, well, yeah, it looks nothing like the original. But in that case, if you wanted to sell your Evangelion, you know, nude boudoir shots, couldn't you make that argument that like, I'm not actually wearing anything. I'm just claiming to be the character. <laughs> Clearly the company would have never approved of this. Yeah, well, well I, I, suppose, I suppose this is why Japan wants to have regulation around this because they want to be able to bite, right? You know, they, they want these edge cases. I, I imagine it's because they want to give rights holders slightly more control and not just use the existing copyright law exceptions, but rather create some, some system whereby formal relationships can be made and therefore rights holders can say, look, this is my hard limit on what I want you to do. If you want to do something completely creative, completely different, then go and do that outside of the copyright uh, regime. Don't, don't seek my rights. Go and do something completely wild, a derivative work. But if you want to do something that is going to piggyback off the the brand and the goodwill that we've generated by creating these characters and investing all the all this money uh then we need to have some control uh in in how that's used and in my view that's kind of fair i think that's like m what i think copyright is good for is actually protecting the original author protecting mm -hmm. not just their copyrights but their moral rights right if you've put something out into the world i think you should have some rights uh, to, to kind of decide how that work is used in, in the future. So I want to ask Kat about these ideas of kind of like how a character is being used, how an intellectual property is being used. Because we mentioned jokingly that, you know, if somebody wanted to use kind of like naughty pictures or something, the, the rights holders might not be happy. But in terms of these Japanese rights holders, they're not the best at inclusion and diversity issues. And so I can imagine like a scenario where they might say, well, we don't want this plus size person to play this character, or we don't want this black person to play this character. Ollie, put your tits away. We're not going to give you the rights. <laughs> That's, I think, where it's going to become most difficult too, though, because even just referencing, um, you know, even when you're discussing the uh, moral of a character or whether or not you want it to be represented that way, like obviously when you look at Nintendo or like Pokemon, right? They're very much family friendly. Once you start making, which a lot of people have, start making that more into an inappropriate um, standpoint, like what's that not rule? Only rule thirty four is that what that is? Yeah, 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 yeah. It, well, that's gender bending too, right? Like, yeah. and there's many, many rules where you can start to apply how you take upon a character, um, and I think that becomes a little bit more difficult with the whole copyright thing. Uh, and and please, girls and, and guys out there, don't don't be encouraged to have to like do the boudoir you like sexy stuff. We're not saying that's the only option of transformative. Mm. Uh, you do you though, but yeah, it definitely becomes a little. I think it's going to be really really hard uh, when you're trying to maintain your property and how it impacts a community or uh, your audience versus um, how somebody will will take it and make it their own or or want to express it in ways that may be inappropriate. Ali, do you think there's cause for concern there with that idea that the, that the rights holder, maybe, you know, somebody is is black and wants to be a professional cosplayer and wants to do a certain character or plus size and wants to get into professional cosplay and do a certain character and they can't get the rights for it. It's transformative. <laughs> well, well, that, well, that's the issue, isn't it? You know, the extent to which they do something which which takes the character out of that kind of recognizable realm. And, you know, my my view is I think the rights holder should be the person that, that decides what's done with the work. But if it's their judgment alone that decides well, we just don't want to be associated with a, a plus size black trans model, that might be a moral judgment they make, which the rest of the country, the rest of the world wouldn't agree with. Then maybe maybe we should say, well, we should be giving slightly more power uh, to, to creators to, to make sure that there's no discrimination with, with rights giving. Right now, I, I actually don't know of any protection in the legal system that means that you're not, that you're not allowed to be discriminatory when you're deciding 
uh, who to give rights to. But I think this is a really interesting point, and I haven't seen much discourse on this. Hmm. I feel like that would come more from the community itself, from those that may feel discriminated against, because... Um, you know, when when you're privileged and you can kind of have the freedom of speech or freedom of creativity, that you may not see some of those consequences unless you do work closer with companies. I actually was told uh, recently by a bigger computer sponsor that they didn't want to work with me because I was too provocative. Oh, really? Yeah. Did they explain in what way they found you too provocative? They didn't explain in what way. What was strange about it, too, is that it was the originally somebody had reached out to me who was probably, you know, the, the, the community manager or somebody that's like, that's their job is to go out and try to find ways of, of, and I'm talking, this is a big sponsor. This is one of the most common, you know, if anything, I have equipment that I use of theirs, too. Hmm. Um, and when... When they first reached out to me, they were even giving me the spiel of like, okay, well, great. You have this amount of following. This is what we can do for you. We can get you all this equipment. We can get you some compensation. And then once it went to a higher up and once it had to be filtered, um, I then was put a stop to. And then I, oddly enough, they even sent me the email, which then discussed that uh, my image was too provocative to represent their company. So somebody aside from this person who thought I would be a good fit, yeah. was then stopped by their higher ups who then said, I'm sorry, unfortunately, that doesn't match our brand image. Huh. And I'm not that provocative, I swear. <laughs> no, I mean, it's just one of those things that it seems like it could have been taken care of with either, you know, a more thought out company policy and research done ahead of time. Occasionally, I'll get like blanket emails that go out to YouTubers where they're just looking to recruit people. And they approach people without actually doing enough research into them. And then they have to down the line be like, oh, we reached out to you and, and offered you this job. Uh, I was met in person at an event what? for this said sponsorship. Yeah. And it seemed like it was good to go before actually there was put a stop to it. So um, when you talk about discriminating, obviously it probably reached somebody who then decided like, no, she's she just doesn't wear enough clothing on her Instagram or she poses provocatively. And uh, oh, yeah. And they even said actually in the in the email that they were concerned my male audience wasn't there for purchasing product ah uh. <laughs> so apparently they were there for other reasons <laughs> if it helps the audience for this podcast definitely is here for mine and bobby's eye candy <laughs> nice nice so the gym's really paying off, <laughs> the gym's so there's, paying off. there was <laughs> There was a lot of concern from cosplayers in Japan that this was going to be this creativity crushing, uh, stringent set of restrictions. And we should reiterate that we don't know what shape these rules are going to take. But in terms of this hand wringing over whether or not this is going to take away people's opportunities to enjoy cosplay or diminish their motivation to be creative with cosplay, do we see that as a problem? I personally don't see that as a problem, um, but I'm a very competitive person. So to me, it's just get good and uh, get creative because it, in a sense, it, I don't think it is fair for the person that does put in this creativity and time and effort it is to make something popular and to make something worth making money from. And they should, in a way, have a lot more um you know, creative control, or at, at least, like you were saying, like kind of having some way of profiting off of, you know, somebody else doing something with what they made themselves. And Ali, in terms of just generic cosplay that people are doing for fun, this shouldn't have any effect, should it? No, from what I can see, if you're not making money from it, copyright's not going to bite. You hear that? You don't have to worry, Brian. No one is going to take away your Rengoku-san costume. <laughs> Hey, thanks very much for listening to Japan by River Cruise. If you enjoy the show and you want some more, then you can get our bonus bits by buying us a coffee at buymeacoffee.com forward slash Japan by River Cruise for $5 a month. You'll get access to the bonus bits for this episode and all of our past episodes. And thank you to all of our guests this week. Of course, Brian, uh, Arikawa Reika, who was our Japanese 
cosplaying guest, and uh, Laura at Rada Sensei, who did the voice dub for her. Yeah, thanks a lot. And we'll put the full interview in the extras. And thank you very, very much to Kat Gunn, who joined us from California. Kat, we really appreciate your time. No problem. I appreciate being on the show. Don't forget, if you guys want to watch me on Twitch or anywhere else, you can follow. Uh, just go up, look up Cat Gun or my alias is Mystic Gun as well. Mystic with a K because it's special. Thanks for being here and we will see you next week. Great work, everyone.